each of those four forms, uh, I have to deconstruct a painting to create that. So this this is a, a very labor-intensive piece right here, and um, it has um, some resin that you're seeing around it. Well, not typical of my work to have it, but uh, interesting to see the sculptural aspects. Again, some more sculptural pieces. Again, this is encaustic, so that's paint. It's pigmented beeswax, it's just that it's white in this particular case. Um, and again, I really was stretching what I call panel-based sculpture. So I love working with the panel and then having my sculpture come off. I don't know at first if I was just a little timid to go into really free form full sculpture or what my reaction was with the panel, but a lot of my sculpture sticks uh, um, based on that. So very simple pieces. Um, and I love installation and I love repetitive patterns, and so that's something that I explore in my work. Um, then what also comes from my work, the background of photography, is shadow. So I love the play of light. And so in a lot of my work, what I'm really studying is what patterns are being made from the piece itself. So I love to play around with that movement and how the um, environment will affect that as well. Uh, this was a piece at a museum back east. Um, I don't know why they choose, chose a blue wall, but I saw, when I saw the installation shot, I was like, oh, what can I do? But, um, and the installation, um, I was not there. I had several pieces in this, and I wasn't there for it, but um, it is basically a cascading element, and it's uh, just for scale reference. It's uh, 12 feet by 8 feet. <coughs> Uh, these are some more of, uh, this is all encaustic again. These are all handmade um, petals, if you will. And these serve at the base of the sculptural form. So it was a suspended form, and that was the base on it. And this is over a barbed wire um, <coughs> armature. And you can see a bee in there that I kept for scale, so you can see. Um, well, yes, bees are always around my work. When I work in I just get used to it. You know? <laughs> Um, again, this is um, in the gallery here right now is a small snippet of these pieces that you'll see, again, um, my study of playing with light um, and how the shadow and movement affects all of that. And this is fiber and encaustic cloth fiber. So um, I have a true passion for fiber incorporating that in, so you'll see that. The, the floral forms in the beginning, no fiber, but this is fiber. And this, again, um, is part of an installation. Um, I had a solo show in uh, San Francisco a year, two years ago. And um, literally, you know, I, I love organic features and playing with it. So yeah, those are, you know, uh, sticks sticking out of the wall <laughs> with encaustic um, fiber pieces on there. And some more um, fiber. This is a suspended piece. Uh, that um, just repeats pattern and form. And again, yeah, this is more uh, fiber. And uh, this is silk. And um, I love working with it in this form, this simple, repeating, undulating pattern. And I think the materials themselves are so beautiful that that's what I am attracted to. Um, I did several pieces. I do a lot of um, donations, and so for breast cancer awareness in October, such um, I always uh, try to do a piece. And so what I wanted to show with this is that you can get um, often these found objects, and this is one way to um, bring the medium into that. And obviously, this was uh, specific for breast cancer awareness. And um, to the right, you'll see totem sticks. And so uh, the reason this is in here is because it shows a little bit more mixed medium. Again, that I have uh, fiber wrapped in on there. There's uh, text that's part of it. Suspended to the left is um, an installation of uh, 10 foot um, fiber and caustic links. And again, I'm playing with the shadow and light on the wall. And you're just really feeling that movement. You can see a little bit more of it there. And uh, paper. Love, love, love paper. So I wanted to put this in here for you to see that um, uh, 
again, suspended away from the wall, and I'm looking at the patterns of light. Um, and I just I love the material itself. So the translucency that the um, encaustic affords the certain materials, such as the silk fiber or the paper, I think is amazing, that luminous quality. And so that's what I'm attracted to and trying to accentuate. Um, paper again, I love book arts. I love, love, love book, book arts. Uh, and so um, I done many different series with them. This is the top of a book. These are part of um, my most recent books that I've done, um, working in caustic and making sculptural forms from the books. Another piece of installation, what you're going to see next, um, included in this on the right, I just wanted to share it. You can really incorporate, incorporate many mediums in here as I've been talking about. Um, so the pieces on the two diptych on the right, the ground that I use on that is tar. And so instead of a traditional ground, I'm using tar. I specifically do that because it has an amazing interplay with um, being caustic. And so it almost ruptures um, when it works together. And so I just I'm trying to give you a pretty broad overview of how this medium um, it is just so fabulous and it, you know, it has such a range. So again, all of this has tar as the um, ground, and that's what you're seeing come through, and that's actually what's moving um, the pigment paint around. This is some of my earlier work that's very, very colorful. Texture, you can do texture in so many ways, and this is put in there so you can see. Um, and one example of a very simple texture pattern. And um, <laughs> these are kind of blown out on here. Most recently, my work um, has been Moving, um, I've been focusing last year on a series um, that are based on Zerongs, um, the the Zerongs of Bali. I had spent a month there, and I was so um, just taken by the colors and you know the warm and wet, right? Wheat, right? I love that, and so I brought that back to my work, and that's really what I'm playing with here. So all of this work that you're seeing, these layers. Um, and crisscross back and forth is really where I'm exploring that. And again, you can tell I'm back to color, which is yay! <laughs> she went away from her body, yay! She doesn't bring the color a little bit. And so again, just the interplay on on um, layering and so much different from some of the earlier work that I showed you. And also, just to make a footnote before I move on about that, is that I truly respect and embrace anyone who just goes and explores whatever is speaking to them in that moment. And so I shared with you a really broad range of my work that I love everything from sculpture, you know, and including fiber. And now I'm really, you know, passionately for the last year exploring kind of this whole warp web fiber recreation, but through paint only. And um, I really love that when I can see that um, in an artist's body work. I do do some works on paper. With encaustics, I just wanted to show you again the variety. So here are a couple of encaustic monotype prints that um, you know it's a huge range what you can do with it. So um, this is one of my work table shots, just so you can see some of these um, forms in progress. And this is one of the fusing techniques of the um, iron. And I have a couple of studio shots, one of my big fiber pieces. And um, yeah, it takes a lot of space <laughs> to do it. Um, next, what's going to come up is a five-minute video, and it just has music, and I hope the level is OK. But it's going to give you an overview of basically making a painting. So that's where we're going to start.
all that I'm talking in is because it's still a part of my spiritual DVD, so that's what I'm I don't know if um, questions and are, are part of this, if there's any Q&A if we're done, so forgive me, and I don't know, but I'm happy to take any questions if anyone has any. No? Yeah. 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 Oh, absolutely. So the question is about ventilation and um, what I'm reading. So um, having a fresh air source is imperative. So um, you don't see it here, but um, in my previous studio, I had um, a ventilation system direct draw off of my pallet, which is one way to address it. Otherwise, it's certainly having a um, fresh air in and a cool out. Um, but the caustic fumes are rather heavy, so that means that they reside anywhere from the base of the pallet that you saw me working on to only about 10 inches above the pallet. So as long as you're not hovering directly over your pallet, you're really not in the area that the heavy fumes are residing. So, and the other thing is that I said I work with the um, paint about 200 degrees. Um, wax will become combustible at about 450 degrees. So it's, it's nowhere near that danger. However, around 300 is when it starts releasing toxins. So I'm never getting close to that point, but it's a great question. Um, again, with the torch and the ventilation, I can certainly make sure that I have a good airflow source. Yeah. How do you store work to be manage? It seems like it's very Right. Um, you know, it's interesting because our, the, the oldest remnants of this work are over 4,000 years old, so that's great when it speaks to permanence, you know, uh, longevity or archival quality. However, in our modern day of shipping things around, yes, things can get very damaged um, just getting to and from galleries. Um, however, it's not as fragile as ceramic work um, or glass work, so as long as you know, best practices are followed in yeah. shipping. Um, when, when I have large shows, um, it, the luxury is that I have art handlers, and I love that when things are created for, for me. Um, otherwise, I'm shopping it myself and doing the double hawks thing. Um, so it just it depends how it goes, yeah. Yeah. What's the difference in, in terms of using the little torch versus the iron? Is that just a texture thing, or is it something else? Right, so the equipment that I'm using as far as for the fusing. So basically, kind of in modern day caustic work, we work with three different fusing tools. So there would be a heat gun, which you, you didn't see, um, a torch, which you saw, and then a tacking iron. The tacking iron is not so common amongst most artists using this. Um, I use a great deal of my work. The torch is the most common. However, um, as I teach, it's basically the right tool for the job. So when I'm working with more flammable material, obviously I stay away from the torch. If I need a really gentle heat, um, I'll use um, the heat gun. And then the tacking iron is basically an extended paint brush. And so the reason I like to show that video at the end is that I'm using it to move the paint around in a very intentional way and not melt through, which is very easy to do, to melt through, but I'm going to do that. So really it's deciding what I want to achieve, texture, smooth, and if I want to move my paint around. Yes. Are the pieces of the, the, from the insulation that we have hanging, are they really heavy? No, it's a great question. So weight is a huge factor in working with this medium because um, you can imagine um, if you put too many layers of the sun. So just for example, I like working on large scale. My panel paintings that are four foot by, you know, five foot, those paintings are easily 65 to 70 pounds. You know, which is a heavy, a heavy painting for that size, you know, being that it's on a panel. So those um, suspended pieces are very lightweight. Um, they're using a um, fiber, and they're embedded very lightly with encaustic. And so they're, they're pretty light, um, so they move easily, they store easily. They're just not, it's not so heavy that those, those pieces can actually be rolled. So when I ship them, they're rolled um, to kind of help their integrity. So, so those aren't very heavy. Yes. On your coffee pieces, do you definitely want to brush the wax on them? When I'm creating it with the fiber, I found the best thing, um, well, let's see. 
the large suspended pieces, the pieces that are more suspended, um, I work on a large top box, so a large top plate, and I'm applying the impasto with a brush, but it's on a heated surface. It's almost like a large griddle, if you will, right? You know, keeping it warm while I sculpt and form it, and then I pull it off. So my fingertips get, you know, pretty sensitized from that time. Did, did, did that kind of answer? You know, it's kind of just a combination of how I'm sculpting it. But you, you can dip. But um, when you dip pieces into encaustic, it gets um, very weighted very quickly, and you really don't get to finesse or fine tune how your material is absorbing the encaustic. And so a lot of times it can just look very heavy handed or clumpy. So I get to do that part. Yes. The the roses. Yes. Yeah, are they so are they lightweight? Because it seems like that just looks like such a massive yeah, um, they, they have a good amount of weight um, to them, but it, it's it's a little deceiving. Um, the first piece that I showed you is not actually a very large piece at all. I do have large scale pieces of that work. Um, and you know, you know, each floral form is probably only um, five ounces a piece. They're not that heavy, you know, so it doesn't really add that much to the overall work. Um, I have devised different ways, but I have um, large pieces, so I have, if they're a five foot painting, um, I came up with a system because they have to ship and carry this reassemble them when they get there. So basically the panel gets shipped and um, the individual in cells is each floral form. It looks like a flower literally because it has a wooden dowel sticking out as a stem. And then on the panel is a drilled hole. And basically it goes through and in the back it's a type of the castle. Oh, so a little engineering. So that's what I say they're not as fragile as they look. No. My daughter, who's seen right here, um, plays ball in the house, bounces things off of a mountain. It's nothing <laughs> ever precious. My artwork is never precious. It is nothing precious. Thank you very much. Thank uh -huh. 
You have a new bathroom behind the door as you go in the door. And you close it, and you look behind, there's a little closet. And one of the closets is a little round thing about oh, this big. And I always ask people, the very people that are in the bathroom, we go in together, and I look, and I say, oh, what do you think that is? Well, at first I ask them, what do you see that's a neutral? And they say, oh, the sign that says no spinning. Uh, well, that's good, but that's not quite enough. And they see part of these, they say, oh, it's, it looks like a piece of coral. No, it's not coral, but you're close. It's calcium. And they look, and they look in the air, and they kind of wonder, and it's, and it's, is, it, is it a bone? Uh, yes, you're right, it's a bone. Where, where? Oh, it looks like it's a, a femur, a hip bone. Yes, you're right, who's? So in 1993, I had my hip bone removed and asked the surgeon, could I have it back up? <laughs> In fact, there's a scheme of it. He's in New Zealand. I had it done in New Zealand. And he, uh, he, he, he said, sure. And then I buried it in the ground to get rid of the whatever on it. And then it came out and you know, put some bleach on it. And it's really the way it works. Better than it would have did when it was in me. Oh, no, I didn't have to think of it. Uh, this is all kinds of unusual things. It's a traditional map from Arizona that the people used to catch fish. It's a key word over there. And way well, in the corner underneath that post is part of a, of a candle, a chandelier. It, it, um, it's, it's a cool chandelier. It has, it's, it's a mathematical chandelier. Uh, it's composed of 15, well, actually, it's composed of a series of three, three tiers, three chains. Three different types of hand blown glass, and inside the glass, it's not doesn't have electricity. It's all candle lit. So there's 15 candles that get lit up, and, and how do you do it? You raise the lower the chain voice. I put on a box to cut it, and few and it make like Igor. And I go up there and I raise the lower it, and make lots of fun. Oops. Okay, yeah, if you can see it, is that one supposed to be there? Sorry about that. That's the air conditioning. It's uncontrollable. <laughs> <laughs> it's supposed to be in house. I don't know. I'm actually building another one. In the corner, on the left hand side, is a, a Tula Gibi stove. And it's probably like five tons of gas. Yeah, so stove. That's how I eat it. I have to use a lot of heat in the northeast. Did you build it yourself? Yes, I did. Wow. I didn't do every part of it. It's six, it was sixty percent of it. So that's a piece of. That's a cherry tree that you can lift up and down and out of there because sometimes I have to move a painting in or out. Oh, sorry. Yeah, so it's a fun house. <laughs> that rug on the floor was a gift because somebody ruined a painting years and years ago and they held it in an exhibition and got smashed or something like that. And she cried and she said, something happened. I said, was it a show? She said, no. And I said, well, who's responsible? She said, I am. I said, all right, you know, what are you going to do? And then about five years later, she came to my house and had that rug. She said, here, I'll this one. I said, yeah, that's great. Much handier than the painting on the floor. <laughs> so this is, oops, uh, this, um, that's my press. One of, I don't have it anymore. And, uh, um, that is an old Martech press. I had about 31 presses all in all. That's Charles Grand in the background and an exposure unit way over there. And uh, I try to, I, I'm a press junkie. More presses and weight than most people. And just a little bit of some art here. Uh, I like mixed media things, but that's 2007, a long time ago. And uh, yeah, would really do that, turn that into an acoustic, couldn't it? <laughs> oh, right. oh, yeah. um, I work in different locations all over, and uh, this is what I did in Peru. I did a whole series in, in Lima, and uh, based upon the activity and the energy that these people have, it's really very exciting. And uh, the color and vibrancy that I was able to, that came out while being there, it's very different than when I'm in the Northeast. It's a very different color sense that just seems to 
permeate through. Not one through, I think it's whole, most of them. And actually, if you look at the borders around the outside, they're not neat and clean and pristine like most printmakers would do. It's very scumbly and messy. And I did that very intentionally just because I wanted to break the rules and break the tradition of being neat and clean. I didn't know how to do that, but I prefer sometimes to rebel. Don't we all do that a little bit? So this is the same impression, actually, with different different things going on as far as color application. And it's the nice thing about being a printmaker that you can vary what you're doing very easily. Actually, yeah, um, in Peru, they didn't have uh, any art supply stores, and uh, so I had to find my own whatever. And I went to the hardware store and I found basically panels, and then along with that, it was. Uh, this concrete additive that makes concrete waterproof. I said, hmm, this looks pretty good. So I bought that and a knife and I applied it to this, uh, the uh, board and did a uh, basically a color graph, which is inking up the surface and then just putting, putting a color on it and then running it through the press. And to give, give it a little bit more structure and consistency, I had a solar plate, which is an etching that I printed along with it. And that gave it the general form of each one. So I don't know if that is probably two. And then I then it still wasn't finished. It, took, it takes a lot to finish something. I just have to paint and draw and continue until I sometimes think it's done. This is called, uh, this is in relationship to a friend of mine whose name was Esteban Vicente. And he was a very, very elegant Spanish man who stood very erect, very tall man, and had a very elegant way about himself. He was a great abstract expressionist painter. He was one of the younger ones, but he was in that category. I had the privilege of working with some of them while they were still alive. These are galas took place on the island of Mykonos. We did workshops all over, and while you know, on Mykonos, so we went over in a little boat to Delos where they had the ruins. And unfortunately, a lot of the local people steal the marble. They take the marble and make bar countertops and all kinds of things in their homes. And, you know, from these archaeological ruins that are quite beautiful. And they just say, this is better than my home. And uh, that's the way these things are. So uh, you know, there's these big discrepancies about where should these very famous pieces like the Elgin marbles and the uh, Pergamon altar and all these things, should they go back? And I have my opinion about that, which is what it is. Boone, North Carolina. Uh, it's a combination of a stone lithograph and a solar plate. So uh, I, I did a little bit of an addition on this where each one was unlike the next one. It just kind of worked differently. Also in North Carolina, this was kind of a, another type of printmaking that I did in the studio of Harvey Littleton, who's the great master of glass. He's the father of the studio glass movement. His father discovered Pyrex in Rochester, in Corning, uh, not Rochester, Corning, but uh, and one of his students was a guy by the name of Dale Chuli. So uh, he's put glass on the map. So he had a studio that said, anything that you have to do, you have to do on glass. So I made etchings and um, miniature graphs is what he called them, uh, by sandblasting and digging into the glass with, with diamond tools and electric vibrating things and trebles and things like that. And uh, actually hollowed out the glass and, so that it would accept ink. And we ink that up and run the glass plate, three inch inch thick glass plate through the press. And it's a beautiful surface to work on, and I always had someone print for me on the name, someone like a Judith O'Rourke, and she was the best printer. She did many impressions. I think I did more impressions, more images than anyone else in that studio. This one was in the central Victorian desert in Australia. I worked in the Aboriginal back, not back. 
with uh, in the women's center, trying to motivate the people there to do things and get them going and give them hope, so to say, with what, they, what their artistic spirit was all about. Because the aboriginals have this great inner inner feeling of being creative. They don't like sitting in front of a computer. You know, they, they do the sort of thing. They dig up and hack out roots and make lizards out of them and do all kinds of things. So while I was there, I was able to try to help them and, and at the same time do some of my own work. This one took place in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Another, I don't know, this, one, this was another one that took place in North Carolina. I did another one take off of this one. But another picture back from North Carolina. Florence and Italy, as I had a school there for 10 years, and um, it was a month long summer program in, in Florence. It was a beautiful place, nice situation. The program started off with five people, and then went to 15, and 45, and 70. We just kept on growing. And it was always a wonderful time because Florence is a great city, and you just can't go wrong going there. And so, very my off time, I would create and be very influenced by the textures. Textures are such a great thing to uh, sort of be influenced by. Well, there's another one from Mykonos. I'm not sure the spring. Who wrote that piece of music? Who wrote that collection? Coleman, right? Aaron Coleman, very good. So uh, the music is actually to me the strongest of the arts. Especially classical. This was a collaboration at Taos, New Mexico with Jennifer Lynch Studio. She surprised me with that blue. I said, I'm sick and tired of making decisions. I've got to get out of your studio. And I went out and I said, she said, before you go, tell me what color you want. I'll put it on. And I said, I don't know. So it just surprised me. So she, I came back and she came up with this cobalt blue on it. So I knocked out. I said, wow, I never would have chosen that. So collaborating and working with other artists is very, very powerful. Okay, I do this with other, other artists, but in the form of um, as the master printer, but then I was the artist and she was the master printer. This is Bridgewater, which was a piece that I did that was filmed. And the whole activity was filmed while doing it. Solar plate printed as an Italio and a relief for it. And then for a while I was working on something really bad. This is bad stuff, real bad. You know what it is? Yeah, it says that on the bottom. <laughs> it is lead. It's sheet lead. And I took and put it on top of the solar plate, actually. Right? And I just put it on top. And it's a thin sheet, and I put it right through the press. I said, wow, it's pretty cool. And I had a friend of mine who was, um, I needed to finish it off with a little bit of polishing. Sanding. So that's really not good to do. So this friend of mine was dying anyway, it's a party condition. You want to do this? Well, he said, sure, I mean, I work with him all the time. So, um, so he helped me out because I wouldn't go near that. So, you like that? It's another little piece. He's still alive, actually, so it didn't kill him. It won't kill him. His heart will do that. This is actually interesting that the way this is in the, because this piece is in the uh, exhibition in the gallery, except it doesn't have the yellow in it. This is a two color print, and the one that's in the gallery has is a one color, so only the blue. So this is intaglio and relief, uh, where the one in the gallery is only intaglio. There's another one. Similar. I had a dream of going to Antarctica when I went to China instead. And here's China. This is where I work in a printmaking making center. It's a really great place. And you can see it's got a studio the size of a basketball court. I mean, it's incredible. And uh, I had eight assistants at different times. That's where the people go. People out, they like monkeys in the cage looking at all the artists that work. And they allow people not to come in. You know, to go into the, there and look through the glass. That's the guy from China there on the right. Because he's Chinese. And that was my studio. Overlooking these great gardens. And uh, 
Uh, see, I had jellyfish to eat one day, and I said, oh, that's a great subject matter to work on. And uh, it comes up with titles like that. Round and square, male-female connection. And that's what I was into doing. It goes in different ways. Another piece of uh, it's a commission type piece. Sometimes I'll take the work, which is just on the left, and you can see how it evolves one to another to another. To, you know, it keep on going and going. But the idea of connection is very important to me with a linear motif. And that comes from my travels to New Zealand where I would look at sheep walking back and forth and leaving the tracks on the hillside. You know, the shadows and the raking light on the green grass, you know, which is really beautiful. So this is another piece from that China last year. And Garden Rhythm. They have big frogs there. Very big frogs. And they go, and make all kinds of noises. This is a good size solar plate print, 40 by 30 inches. Awfully scary to do. Especially when you don't really. It was a very interesting experience doing these pieces there because these Chinese artists and people, administrators, and all that are around, they don't respond to the work. They just look, they look, and they look, and they look up close, and they don't say anything, but I can't say anything because they don't speak the language, right? They look, and they just don't say so I kind of wonder, what are they thinking? Why are they, you know, so I felt very vulnerable and insecure because. I didn't know, geez, it's worth insulting them. Is it, well, what's it doing to them? You know, I didn't know. It was very, very scary. But I got back and I thought it was okay after I got home. And my friends said, yeah, it's okay. It's really not bad. This was probably the most elaborate piece I ever did in my life. This goes in Taliyah and each goes to screen printing on top of, you know, just kind of went on and on. And uh, it, uh, I was quite happy when I finally finished it. And that's back in my studio again with an Olympic t shirt on. I'm that I didn't go to. What were you doing with that? That was rolling ink on the surface. Uh, it's basically, it doesn't show a color because it's very transparent ink. And just rolling it out on there to just to give it a glazing effect. Yeah, giant one. Yeah. Well, any bigger ones than that, but that's a, that's a yeah, Sometimes I'll paint into the work. It's a very exciting medium to work in for me. Uh, I was a stonographer, which took a long time to make things evolve. So that's the beginning of the work. And then I start painting on top of it. And all. I think that's it. Yep. Thank you very much. Happy to answer any questions. When you do large pieces like that, do you start with a small sketch first or do you just go? Well, oh, thank you for asking that. Uh, I tend never to start with a sketch or anymore. I used to do that. And sometimes I'll warm up with sketches, but I, my mental frame doesn't. Uh, I find that if I try to copy something or work from something, it tends to become mechanical. And there's a spirit that becomes lost. And maybe it was because of my association with so many abstract expressions that painted without that kind of thing. And, and, and I just, I just, it rubbed off on me. And, and I just said, oh, this is so great just to go for it. It's not that it works by any means. Sometimes it, Lots of times it doesn't work, and I turn it upside down and start working the other way around. So it takes on its own life. Well, good. It's nice and quiet now. Can you explain your difference in your solar technique versus traditional printmaking? Sure. Very happy to do that. I've printed like 20 years ago. Yeah. I've done all aspects of printmaking. Most aspects of printmaking are pretty dangerous. You'd be using eyes or acids or solvents and things like that. And lots of my friends are no longer around because they're dead. Yeah, so, uh, uh, or they're sick. You know, it, 
it affects our brains and things like that. And that's why I asked the question about the cell being ventilation. But solar plate is a material that is a um, polymer surface on top of the steel. And when you take this material and stick it in the sun, it becomes hard. So if you stop out any areas from the sun or any parts that you don't want the sun to hit with paint or objects or anything, you, or an image or photograph, anything on a, on a clear film, it's going to stop the light from hitting it out. In other words, it's going to mask out. So the other areas that are exposed become hardened. The softer ones are washed away with water, tap water. Tap water edges the plate and it bites it. The rest of it makes it hard. So you have a plate that's high and low. That's it. And you ink it up and print it. You can print it as an Italian print, like etching, or as a relief print, like a little ink up. So, so that was my baby. I discovered it when I was in Germany. My professor, Kurt Lowasser, said, here, try this out. So I looked at it and said, well, we're supposed to do this. And then he said, figure it out. He was teased. He was really teased. He just, you know, figure it out. And, and he taught me so much with that idea, letting me try to figure this out. And I did. And I said, oh, I can do this with this one. It, it was meant to stamp. It was meant to print labels on cans and guitar picks and relief or anything. Just stamping. And I took the principle. And I ran with it and said, okay, we're not going to stand with that. That's too crude. Let's put it inside rather than the top side. So turning the whole thinking around made it what it is today. You have a question? Yes, we have a question. Uh, none that? Would you throw a ball if it just wouldn't work? I don't think any kind of would look good. You would be a perfect Magellan and Balboa and Pizarro and Cortes and 
and be the father, and be the father of Monica and Joey and Jane Allen and Mississippi. You know, all these sick words, sorry. And uh, so we have to draw these people. And I liked it. I liked it. And she, she, she told the whole class, she said, before we give you the good paper, you have to do it on news first. And then you can, if your drawing's good enough, then I'll give you the good paper. Well, she said to me, Dan, you don't have to do that. We'll give you the good paper. We'll give you the vanilla paper. Vanilla paper. Really <laughs> good. So it just sort of made me feel like that was so she was my inspiration. And then in science class later on, we had to draw diagrams. And that's why I love science. And uh, I'm a vice president of the board called Inspiration Plus, which is a part of the Science Foundation. And so it's this uh, 501c3 that believes in all kinds of scientific projects and artistic projects and music and everything. We put it all together and we get out of life. You know? <laughs> so uh, it's, a, it's a really great thing. Yes, yeah. And if you have a piece where you have a subject of blue but it looks very like pastel, thick, is, are you using um, anything besides just the, the solo plate? Yes. Uh, uh, I paint on top of the work many times, but I don't usually use just paint. I, I, I like strip drawing tools more. I like drawing more than actually painting, but sometimes I resort to paint. And uh, in that case, I, I used Caran d'Ache crayons, which is a water-soluble crayon, beautiful crayon made in Switzerland, and you add acrylic into it, it becomes paint. Because so, yeah. it's almost